we're live streaming this panel over the Premiere Pro Facebook page. Um, so we'll be taking during the Q&A session some questions from our online audience as well as some questions from you all here today. So put your thinking caps on while we, uh, while we listen to our fabulous panelists talk about what they do, some of their history, um, and some of their perspectives on editing. I think it's going to be a fantastic panel. Again, my name's Margot. I'm a manager at Adobe, and I'm focused on our professional film and video market. So um, we'll just reintroduce our panelists. This is Lillian Benson. Uh, her credits include Chicago Med um, and Maya Angelo, Maya Angelo and Still I Rise, which is a new project. So welcome, Lillian. And to my left, we have Lisa Churgan, who is currently working on Old Man and the Gun and has worked on Cider House Rules and Reality Bites, among many other projects. Welcome. We have Edie Ichioka, whose credits include Toy Story 2 and the Box Trolls. Welcome, Edie. Next to Edie is Virginia Katz whose credits include Beauty and the Beast, which were released this past year, and Dreamgirls, welcome. And next to Ginny, we have Lindsay Klingman, whose credits include, and prepare to be super impressed, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, War of the Roses, Little Man Tate, among many others, welcome, Lindsay. And then finally, we have Tara Lynn Shropshire, whose credits include Eve's Bayou and Beyond the Lights. Welcome, Terry Lynn. And we'll start with you, Lillian. So what inspired you or led you to becoming an editor? It was a college professor. Um, I went to art school and not film school. And uh, in a photography project, um, he said that he thought that I had uh, the best sense of sequence he'd ever seen. And he asked me whether I was in film, and I said no, you know. I was studying art to become a public school teacher, which I did for two years, and, but that planted the seed so that when I decided to leave teaching, I had met a, a Cinema Verite um, editor uh, in New York, and she said if I ever decided to leave, she, she would help me. And so she actually wasn't lying, and she meant it. <laughs> and she helped me get my first two jobs. But uh, that's how I got started in it. And basically it was understanding that there was this thing out there that was unnamed that perhaps I could do. Fantastic. And we'll ask the same question for you, Lisa. How did you get into editing? Did you know that was a discipline? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. We had this conversation before. I didn't even know that editing existed. Um, my brother-in-law shot a movie in my apartment in New York. He was going to NYU film school. And that was the first time I actually saw what people did behind the camera. Uh, I got a crush on someone. I thought it was really, some, you know, that was as good a reason as any at that point. Um, and then I, uh, I started exploring what people did. Uh, I went back to Oberlin and I actually got involved in the, film, in the theater department. But it was the act of actually working on a project, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I think that that fascinated me. I got a job through a family friend as a secretary in a documentary company and I, answered the phone in the editing room, which got me fired, but I had qualified for unemployment. So then I began that whole thing of working for free, which, of course, we're not supposed to say we do. And as a board member, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but that's how we all get our start. And it was just the fascination of that. It was sort of like a duck to water. Fantastic. Edie, what about you? You have kind of an interesting story. Yeah, um, I grew up in Berkeley, and Berkeley is a college town, so there were a lot of art houses there. And um, not only were there a lot of art houses showing very unusual pictures, there was the Pacific Film Archive, and there still is. But at the time, it was curated by Tom Luddy, who many of you might know from his work producing for Francis Coppola. He also ran the Telluride Film Festival for a long time. And he curated an amazing array of films, which sort of provided a 
film school for people who lived in a time with no Netflix. Um, <laughs> imagine that. Um, and I uh, realized there was a discipline of editing and looked at movies with an eye to that, um, decided this is for me, and um, got a job at a cafe near the Salzans Film Center where everyone would have lunch and got to know the people there and said, if you ever need someone to volunteer in your cutting room, call me. And there were documentary editors who had no money who welcomed free help that would come early, stay late, do all the jobs, and that's how I got started. Wonderful. Filing a lot of trims. <laughs> that's how we probably all got our start, filing trims for free. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Ginny, what about you? Mine's very easy, uh, nepotism. <laughs> my, <laughs> my father was a film editor, and um, I was between college. So they, my parents wouldn't let me hang out and go to the beach and do what <laughs> people do, so I went in to help him. And basically, that was it. I was studying psychology in college and did a major turnaround because really from the moment I walked into the cutting room, I just fell in love with it. And my, I didn't, luckily I didn't have to work for nothing, but my dad was cheap. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I probably didn't get paid, but other people get paid. But um, anyway, so I was really plunged into right away um, immersed, immersed into editing. He would give me scenes to cut like the second week, and this was on film, and he'd say, here, cut this scene. I didn't know what that meant. So eventually, instead of just cutting to one person and cutting to one person and back and forth, and eventually I learned. So it was through my father, and it was, it was a blessing. And Lindsay, what about you? Um, I love movies. I went all the time. It was like my favorite thing. My whole family, that's what kept us together as a family at dinner. We talk about movies. And um, I was finishing college with my degree in history, not knowing what to do. I thought publishing. And I was at a party just before I graduated. And I met a guy who was, he said he was a film editor and I, for the city of New York. And I said, what is a film editor? You mean, you work in film, you get paid to work on movies? He said, well, yeah, I mean, I'm doing something on code violations in buildings right now. You know, it was like that, but. And he told me about the industry in New York. I had no connection to Hollywood movies, but I thought, oh, I want to work on films. Also, I knew there were a lot of um, art films being made in New York and stuff like that. So I got the Yellow Pages, which were then, everybody was in it, under film editing, pages and pages of film editors. And I started calling. I started a day. I was very shy. But occasionally, I realized the phone was, uh, so I would go over there. And this was a different time in the history of uh, social development because it was before the women's movement and before the ERA was presented, everything. And they would say, it was all guys all the time. And they'd say, we don't hire women because we don't want to watch our language because you can't carry a lot of cans the way a guy can. This was film, by the way. I finally got a job, it took a long time. And my first day in film, I walk in, he said, okay, you're gonna cut negative today. Now, I don't know if anyone here knows about film, but I had never touched film. <laughs> <laughs> and I was cutting A and B rolls. Don't get your fingers on this. <laughs> it's the original. So <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I, did, I cut negative. I did everything in this editing house. And um, I learned from my terrible mistakes which you guys don't even need to make because you can undo. <laughs> Thank God. That's what happened. Thank you, Lindsay. And Terry Lynn, last but not least, how did you become an editor? What led you into this discipline? Well, I started editing. Um, I went to USC with the express purpose of getting into the film department. Um, I went in as a freshman as a journalism major. Um, I applied, eventually applied to the film department. 
I got in um, and uh, decided to keep uh, to double major, which the journalism department was always happy that you had another field that you were interested in, but the film department really didn't want you to do anything but film. So I, um, I managed to kind of take care of journalism during the summers and do the film during the rest of the year. But my first experience with editing was actually having to edit my own work, which is a lesson in and of itself. Um, and I found myself as I was going through the program and you know, uh, of all the things that you have to do, which in, and initially you have to do everything, um, is is that I looked forward to just getting into the room and with the material and working on the material. I didn't particularly enjoy going out and having to shoot the material necessarily, but um, you know, ultimately where I found my joy um, and instinctual was building the story. You know, working on the story. Um, problem solving the things that I, I had created on set in, you know, back in my editing room. And so that's where I, I initially really found my love of editing. I think that it really came from my love of writing. But I also found that when I was, you know, and from a journalism standpoint, even when I was writing, I found that a lot of even my friends would give me their papers and say, can you look at this? And I'd say, well, if you move this here and do this and, you know. So I feel like editing is something that's always been natural to me on a certain level. So, um, but initially when I graduated, I didn't, it's not the field that I immediately kind of went towards. I actually had made a film and was going, trying to decide what am I gonna do? And I worked as a PA and a production coordinator. I did a lot of other things. And then at a certain point on the side, I was still editing friends' films. And, and, I, and at a certain point I said, look, I really wanna focus. What, what do I love? What do I love? Why, why am I doing this? <laughs> And I, and I then found myself going back towards editing. And like you, it's like, though I had edited it back then, it was 16 millimeter. Um, people asked you a lot, do you have 35 experience? Do you have, you worked at, have you, have you handled 35? Which is, in my mind, harder than 16, but you know. Um, so me, I also had to, one of my first jobs in a cutting room, in a 35 millimeter cutting room, was going in and working for free and helping out and filing trims and working under you know assistant and observing and uh, and then eventually I, I I actually got my first second assistant kind of a second assistant job um, having come to a panel very much like this and uh, during the lunch period there was an editor who was sitting who was you know I was having lunch and th there was a um, there were a lot of tables available, and so uh, she asked if she could join me. She was with somebody else, and we started talking, and she asked me what I was doing, and, and we exchanged information, and I said, if you're ever looking for a, as an assistant, um, I'm, you know, I would be, I would love for you to consider me, and literally, probably a couple months later, her first assistant called me and asked me to come in for an interview, and that was how I got my first, you know, paid, paid gig. So this is a perfect lead-in, actually, Terry Lynn, um, talking about how you decided editing was really where your heart was. Uh, you can't get through a discussion like this without seeing some of the work from our editors here. So we're going to take a look at some clips that each editor has brought. And what we'll do is we'll screen the clip. We'll have each of you give a quick intro of what the clip is and what, what project it's from. And then after the clip, maybe talk a little bit about the context around it, why you chose to show this clip to our audience today. So Lillian, back to you. Um, how about a quick intro of your clip? Okay. For those of you who know me and know my work, um, I've done a lot of documentaries, and actually the person who got me my first two jobs was a Cinema Verite editor who worked with the major people like uh, Ricky Leacock and D.A. Pennybaker in New York. So my um, uh, roots are um, historical films, journalism, uh, truth, 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 fact, fact, fact. Um, now I'm working in fiction, and it is really the script that drives um, what I do. Um, you still bring yourself, the heart, the mind, um, the experience to the machine, but um, it's less uh, factual. Um, so, but it's true because it's true to the human experience. 
This film is an example of something that I first started doing in 1990. I had the first opportunity to be a troubleshooter on a film that was needed to be fixed. Um, and I didn't know that I could do it, but then I did it, and so I could do it. Um, and I, and I, I was able to do it on a film called um, Prospecting for Planets for the Astronomers. Because I didn't know science, I didn't know the experience of the whole team, um, I could approach it very um, objectively. So I discovered the story that nobody else saw. This Maya Angelou piece is uh, something that's more recent, uh, two years ago, and I was called in to replace an editor who was not giving them what they needed and who had basically left um, his station and aban not abandoned them, but left his station uh, to be polite. Um, and so they went to look for someone else to come in to do it. The, all, the, all the feedback they had gotten uh, was that there was not enough of Dr. Maya, there was not enough emotion, and there were not enough of her words. Um, this was a Chicago-based team. They didn't know me. They found me through my vast network of friends. Uh, and um, so this, was, this scene was the one that convinced them that I knew what I was doing. And, um, and, and it's poetic in a way that the rest of the film had not been. But once I did this, they could see that I was going to help them fix it. The end of the story is that it went on, um, uh, it got into Sundance, it did very well, it got its national release uh, for Academy uh, consideration, it did not get nominated. Um, but it did air on PBS, and it's probably going to sell a truckload of DVDs for the producers because of Dr. Maya's name. And American Masters said that this she is an American Masters master, and this film has to look like that. So that was my charge. So this is the first sequence that convinced them that I knew what I was doing. Great, thank you. So we'll show the clip. I open my mouth. To the Lord and I won't turn back, no, I will go, I shall go to see what the end is going to be. In my memory, Stamps is a place of light, shadow, sounds, and Enchancing odors, the yellowish acid of the ponds and rivers, the deep pots of greens cooking for hours with smoked or cured pork, and above all, the atmosphere was pressed down with the smell of old fears. Is that all the size of the bridge? <laughs> I was terribly hurt in this town and vastly loved. My grandmother never spent money on anything but land. She owned land. And a lot of poor whites lived on land we owned. One day, three white girls came down into the clearing in front of the store. And they said, hello, Annie, hello to my grandmother. And Mama said, hello, Miss Elaine, hello, Miss whatever their names were. And one girl told the other, she said, stand on your hands. And she stood on her hands and had no drawers on. And her dress fell down around her. And she showed herself to my grandmother. Oh, I couldn't stand it. Mama started singing, bye and bye. I found that I was praying too. How long could Mama hold out? What new indignity would they think of to subject her to? And she stood there until the girls went on and walked on past the store and into town. Because my family is from the South, and my uh, family members, many of whom uh, were Dr. Maya's age, I knew of this kind of indignity, not firsthand, because I grew up in, in, in New York, um, but I knew about what it meant 
to show yourself mm -hmm. to an older woman. Uh, what the dangers were um, in terms of challenging that. Also, uh, what the um, songs of the church meant to people and how they would sometimes use them as a mantra to live through something. So this was not um, new territory for me. Um, and so as a result of that personal knowledge, um, I could craft it differently than perhaps someone else could. Um, and the one of the things that you will, you could see um, the device they used was um, using Dr. Maya's words from recorded um, uh, books on tape um, to intersperse within um, the film. So that last line um, before on the girl's face, which is obviously a recreation. So that was another device that was used. And that was a new device that came based on the um, feedback um, from the clients and from audiences that they showed it to that the two directors then uh, you know, created the solution. But that meant pouring through all of her um, books on tape. Mm -hmm. Which a lot was, of material. was a lot of material. Now, the good news is Dr. Maya is a storyteller, so she can always, mm -hmm. you know, just do all that stuff on camera. But the other danger is that um, because she said some of the things before, um, it might sound a little um, old. So we had to listen for those things, which is not unlike listening to a different take of an actor with a particular line. You, you'll hear a line and you say, no, 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 that sounds the most real. Um, so this was a 90 minute show, so this is a fraction of it. But, um, and that uh, um, historical material was an interview that she did with Bill Moyers years ago. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I think it was probably clearance reasons, they didn't use the remaining stuff where she walks through the town with him, and she had not been to that town in 30 years, and I thought, what would it be like to go back to a place of both, as she said, pain and joy, and see that, so all you gotta do is get in the headspace. I mean, it's not an all that you have to do, but it really is all that you have to do, is try to get into the headspace of the character or um, the historical settings, because um, we can't experience everything, but what we've experienced helps us uh, edit whatever we get to do. Yeah. Thank you, that was a wonderful clip. Lisa, you're next. Why don't you give us a quick intro? Um, I want to expand on what Lillian just said. Uh, as an editor, we bring ourselves. And the emotion that we experience, um, the reason I picked a clip from Dead Man Walking, which I apologize to everybody for having to watch on a Saturday morning, um, but it was something that took a long time to come to, even though it seems very simple. The structure of the film was entirely different. You didn't see the execution, and just in case that was a spoiler alert, he dies. Um, uh, the, um, uh, it was, it's the, Tim Robbins had a very specific, obviously, viewpoint about capital punishment, which I, share a thousand percent. I know that one of the things that happened is that I did actually personally have a friend who was for capital punishment before he went and saw the movie, mm -hmm. and afterwards he was probably sure that he wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, the, to, yeah, it's like, I, you know, it just doesn't compute to me putting anybody to death. But uh, the, um, to set this up, because it's coming out of nowhere and you see some very heinous things, there were 11 dialogue scenes, like long dialogue scenes. I happen to love dialogue scenes. I love examining and going through and getting the perfect take and of course taking other words and making everything flow and have it go back and forth. And I had two thoroughbreds, Arabian Stallions, Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn. I mean, you talk about an embarrassment of riches, it was amazing. And so through the course of those scenes, he actually does become a human being. At the beginning, he is not. He is a typical redneck and trying to seduce a nun 
and be disrespectful and everything like that. But when he finally does confess his part, um, you, I think we did a really effective job of making him a person. And this clip was, it was through a lot of change in structure of the movie that it ends up juxtap um, juxtaposing the, the rape, murder, and the execution. And that's the scene you're about to see. I apologize. <laughs> I just want to say, I think killing is wrong, no matter who does it, but it's me or y'all or your government.
that's a beautifully edited scene. And and like you were saying, for someone who really loves a dialogue scene, the fact that there were almost no words in that entire clip was really, really astounding. Beautiful. Well, we had all those dialogue scenes. Yeah. And I, I sent an email to Tim to tell him that I was going to be using this. And I said, in those days, we were on Avid's, you know, I mean, on, on a flatbed. I could, and there's a credit, which he didn't uh, tell me he was going to put in. It's at the very end of the credits. And it says, this film was edited on old-fashioned machines. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Which um, I thought was uh, really funny. But there was one dialogue scene we never changed, like the entire time. And you know, you're rolling down, you have to thread up the cam, and you roll it down. It's like, oh, they're going to want to change that. And you don't want to change it. You really like have to get to it. Um, and we never changed it. it wow. Like, can't remember which one it is, but I do remember there was one. Edie, let's go to you, and you can uh, give us a little background on your clip. Uh, the clip I brought today. Uh, is from a feature-length documentary that my husband David Ichioka and I made. Uh, we, it seemed particularly appropriate uh, for this event because it is about Walter Murch, who, as many of you know, is an amazing editor. I assisted Walter on a few projects, uh, Godfather Three, Godfather Trilogy, and English Patient, and learned an amazing amount from him, and uh, decided to make a documentary about it with my husband. Fantastic. So here we go. You are building a very complicated jigsaw puzzle and there is no picture on the box to tell you exactly what to do. And the pieces you're working with are pieces from all kinds of different jigsaw puzzles. The um, mystery about a film editor is compounded by the fact that we call ourselves editors. Um, which is something that we borrowed from um, publishing. In film, the editor is the person who assembles the material into a filmically coherent scene and then looks at it with the director. The director makes suggestions about what to do, um, but then it's the director who goes away and it's the editor who actually does the work of reassembling it. When I first started out, most of my brain was trying to figure out how to cut from shot A to shot B. Let me find the shots that will have the best cuts. I don't do that anymore. Uh, and I, in fact, I stopped doing that quite soon because it's like banging your head against the wall. At best, it's like somebody who plays the piano technically perfect, but who loses the spirit of what the music is about. If you can't think of any way that technically is going to be good, just by the boldness of your approach, say, that's what I'm going to do. That was the effect of a film like Breathless when it came out in 1959. Its effect was, I don't care. I'm going to have jump cuts. I don't care that they're jump cuts. Whereas before that, you did everything you could to avoid that kind of staccato effect because it broke the illusion. Paradoxically, Breathless didn't care, and yet there was a very powerful sense of the story and who these people were. It was the equivalent of a painter saying, sure, it's, it's all right for a brush to leave evidence of its passing. The original plan was that Apocalypse Now was going to play in one theater only in the geographic center of the United States for 20 years. And it would be a thing that you would go to like Mount Rushmore. Families would travel in their station wagons from across the country to come see Apocalypse Now in a specially built theater, kind of like an IMAX theater. But it would also have this new sound system that would surround the audience with sound and give them an experience they couldn't get in other theaters. Well, that idea lasted for a couple of months, and then um, economic reality set in.
The film was distributed in a normal way, but it also had this new sound system, which we had invented, what is now called the 5.1 format. It was a distribution of channels in the theater that, um, at Francis's urging, we invented for that film. And how do you design the sounds to fit that new format? I had to do that. Uh, to think intelligently about how we were going to arrange the sounds to fill this new space. And that's where the term sound design came from. You're hearing the music and the helicopters, but you're not hearing gunfire, explosions, all of that kind of stuff. As a mixer, I'm playing a shell game kind of like those people in Times Square. My hands are moving very fast, making these various elements come and go in a way that when you watch the whole thing, you think they're there all the time, but they're not. They're only two and a half or maybe three there at any one moment, which allows you to hear what's happening with a greater clarity. If I simply put everything there all at once, the whole thing would collapse into a big ball of sound in which you really couldn't hear anything with any satisfactory detail. Whereas when you play the shell game, you can see the forest and the trees simultaneously. And all the children are insane. So many of us um, started out on film. I started on an upright movie, Ola, and worked on flatbed, 60 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and the benefit of film was that you stood right next to your editor and would hand your editor the clip that they wanted and think about what they were doing and didn't check in at tentpole times when you're doing an output <coughs> nowadays. I love modern technology. I don't want to go back, but the film is sort of an effort to communicate a thought process that maybe isn't communicated as frequently nowadays where you're assistants are down the hall or maybe even in a different building mm -hmm. than you are because you are able to work independently. Yeah, thank you. I can't work independently. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, every assistant. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes. Here, here. All right, Ginny, how about you? Okay, just on that one point, I am t technologically illiterate. So I count on my assistants, I don't know if Ian and Joey are here, um, to help me through all of that. You know, I, I feel like there are things I, I really don't even want to know because we have so much that we're taking in and doing that the technology of it all is beyond me. <laughs> so anyway, I chose a clip from Gods and Monsters which is a movie that the director, Bill Condon, and I did years ago. And I chose this clip because we had the movie kind of all working except for one scene, which was a pivotal scene in the movie where um, Ian McKellen is talking to Brendan Fraser about um, just, they're just talking. They've come out of, being together, and, and Ian has a plan. And we kept searching for a moment to get across that one plan of his that would allow him to do what he had wanted to do. It, you have to see the movie to see, to find the, to, to see why. But, we went through, and we'd been through the film many times, and it was late at night, and we were getting ready for a screening, and we were just so searching for this one moment and found it. And it's that instant, which it's rare, that when you find like this just one cut that says everything mm -hmm. in one dialogue scene and in one moment that, uh, to me, and I think still to Bill, is just an amazing moment. So you'll see the scene, 
And it happens after um, Brendan says, he's talking about going to war and how he ended up not going to war. And he said, he was talking about his father and he said, he laughed at me. And there's one shot, there are two close-ups of Ian and I think it's the second shot, I'm pretty sure, that gives you an idea of what is coming. So, this is it. See, is this, um, Yes, it's the only memento I ever kept. Hmm. My original sketch for the monster. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. When we've finished eating, if Hannah's not back, shall we try a few more sketches? I thought you'd given up on my drawing. Yeah, but I'd like to try again. Give us something to do while we wait. Tell me something, Clayton. Do you believe in mercy killing? Oh, I never really gave him much thought. Must have come across some situations in Korea. A wounded comrade, or perhaps even an enemy, you know, someone for whom death would be a blessing. I never went to Korea. I never even made it through boot camp. And you said, and I was a Marine, which is true. You filled in the rest. Oh, I see. Old man was a Marine. Lied about his age and he enlisted. Is this the Great War? Yeah. Yeah. By the time he was ready to ship out, all the fighting was over, though, so. Felt like he'd missed out. Well, that was a very lucky thing indeed. That's not the way he saw it. To him, it was like his life never really got started. Nothing else seemed to matter. Certainly not his family. Is that why you became a Marine? For your father's sake? I figured it'd be the next best thing. I mean, but, I, you know, I loved it too. I really, I did. It was, it was a chance to be a part of something important, something that's, something that's bigger than yourself. Now the guts for it. Mm. Literally. My appendix burst. They gave me a medical discharge. And the only thing I can think is, how the hell am I going to tell my father? And you know what happened when I finally did tell him? He laughed at me. Well, that was a break, huh? So, no war stories for this pup. That's why you're wrong, Clint. You've just told me one. Very good story indeed. So, anyway, in the in in the continuation of the movie, he tries to get. Clayton, Brent, Brendan to kill him. And in that moment where his eyes shift like that, we felt was like the, that moment where he knows that he's got, you know, he's gonna do it and it's planned. Mm. So, um, and Lynn, Gre Lynn Redgrave was in it, who was nominated and I think won an Oscar for that. Uh, Ian was nominated, and Bill, who wrote the script and directed it, Bill won an Oscar for writing that for the. For, so, um, it's always been one of my favorite movies, and uh, for a lot, a lot of you know, and that was on film, and it was, um, you know, you, it, it's you in a mo in a small movie. It was a small movie, and having gone on to uh, bigger films and all, there's something about the more intimate uh, small movies that always ha holds this place in my heart because they, you are in a much more compact and um, kind of more intimate world mm -hmm. than when you, you know, and then it, as opposed to like Beauty and the Beast or something so big, 
that there's so many more people involved and you know you kind of lose touch with like visual effects and everything and this movie will you know just always had this um, intimacy and uh, I think incredible performances and writing. I, I did literally get goosebumps when that scene was playing. It's oh, super powerful, yeah. yeah. Lindsay, um, let's have you talk about your clip. <clears throat> uh, before I talk about my clip, I, I think I'd like to fill in the 50 years between when I last <laughs> mentioned I was doing A and B roles. And um, uh, because I worked for a long time in the, in the industry, the commercials, industrials, educational, that whole world in New York City. I was also very active in the anti-Vietnam War movement. And a guy was looking for a cheap editor who was interested in history, me. And so I started working with Emil D'Antonio, who was uh, a crazy, passionate, nuts guy, but really dedicated to making the film. And I worked seven days a week, 20 hours a day for a very little money. I got paid, but I might as well not, you know. <clears throat> and uh, it was nominated for an Academy Award. It was called Near the Pig. It was a mess, but if you sat through it, you would know everything there was to know about our involvement in that war. After that, I um, just worked as an assistant in commercials. I cut some more educationals, blah, blah, blah. And I heard about another film about Vietnam that had a Hollywood connection. Bert Schneider was the producer, and so it was well-funded. And uh, I called the director, who had just hired a friend of mine, and I said, why don't you hire both of us? So he did. And that movie was Hearts and Minds, which won an Academy Award for Best Feature Documentary, and uh, is still apt today about the American mentality in foreign policy, and uh, you know, we're number one. Um, I was working on the film, and Bert Schneider had his Hollywood editor. He had done Five Easy Pieces, Last Picture Show, Easy Rider, blah, 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 lots of movies. And uh, the, editor, the sound editor was Jim Nelson. And I thought, he's not going to do a good job because he doesn't love my movie. He doesn't care about it. I've spent a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So I went into the mix with my 16 millimeter reels of genuine B-52s flying uh, that was actually recorded on a B-52. So of course it was lousy, but I wouldn't admit that. And he came in, this was in the days when we, we, all the sound was on mag with like 40 reels of 35 millimeter sounds that combined to make the best 52s I'd ever heard. And I surrendered. I gave up and uh, cut to like a year and a half, two years, three years later, uh, he was living next door to Michael Douglas, who was not yet a superstar. And Michael was in San Francisco in a television series and producing this film, Cuckoo's Nest. And he called Jim and he said, do you know any cheap editors? <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> And that was an incredible break. Richard Chu, by the way, who's speaking this afternoon, was the first editor. And Shelley Kahn also came on. And I would pinch myself how lucky I am. So that was like a whole new chapter in my existence. And uh, I loved working on features because I had felt at the time, before reality television and videotape, that the most moving moments in a documentary film were often the most painful for the people in them. And I just felt like I didn't like it. So I stayed in fiction film, and um, mostly, not always. And um, ultimately, I got to work with many people, including Danny DeVito, who directed Matilda. We did uh, War of the Roses, which Michael Douglas was in, and then, um, anyway, he did Matilda. So this is the clip. I chose it because it's fun. Uh, we could use a little lighthearted huh? footage right now. So <laughs> and I think a lot of people, young people, have grown up with the movie. So that's why I chose it. Just random. So I hope you enjoy it.
Sit! What's up? Beat me. Bruce Bog Trotter. Would little Brucey come up here, please? is none other than a vicious sneak thief. You're a disgusting criminal, aren't you? I don't know what you're talking about. Cake. Chocolate cake. You slithered like a serpent into the school kitchen and ate my personal snack! Do you deny it? It's hard for me to remember a specific cake. This one was mine. And it was the most scrumptious cake in the entire world. My mom's is better. <gasps> it is, is it? How can you be sure unless you have another piece? Sit down, Bob. Chocolatey, eh? Now, eat it. I don't want any. Thank you. Eat it! Don't eat it. She wouldn't give him cake. It's poison. Something's up. Look like you enjoyed that, Brucey. Yes, yeah. You must have some more. Uh, no thanks. But you hurt Cook's feelings. Huh? Cookie. <laughs> she made this cake just for you to have on your very own. Her sweat and blood went into this cake. And you will not leave this platform until you have consumed the entire confection. <laughs> entire confection. See you at lunch. Thank you, Cookie. Rotten kids. You wanted cake, you got cake. Now eat it. What? Without a doubt. Bruce looks real bad. Give up. <laughs>
will stay five hours after school and copy from the dictionary. Any children who object will go straight into the chokey together. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, we are running a little short on time, so I want to make sure, Terry Lynn, that we get to your clip. So um, I will ask you to give us a quick intro, and then we'll, we'll roll it. Okay. Uh, I chose an oldie but goodie. Uh, it, I did not choose it necessarily particularly it was because it was difficult to cut or you know, ex exceedingly challenging, but uh, I chose this clip because um, I don't know how many, I mean, I've, all of us at some point work with a director for the first time, whether it's a first time director or whether our relationship, you know, we're, we're working with them initially. And I find that, you know, it's incredibly important, especially during the dailies process, to be able to look at the material that's coming to you, look at a scene that's coming to you, especially when, you know, and this was a film that uh, was shooting very quickly and uh, I needed to be able to kind of communicate to the director in terms of dailies. And, you know, there was a time when we used to actually get together and watch show dailies together at the end of the day, but um, that seems to have kind of gone away. Uh, so this was a scene where when the dailies initially came in, um, I looked at the scene and on a certain level, it was all there. I mean, you know, technically, uh, it was a scene where there's two people, and they're playing a game of basketball, and uh, and so the dailies themselves reflected the nature of the game. You know, uh, who was shooting when, when baskets were made, all that type of thing. But I also started to feel that as I was watching take after take after take, that there was something that I wasn't feeling that I knew I should be feeling. And so after watching all of the dailies, there was a certain point where I had, you know, I had to make, well, there was no had to make the decision. I needed to talk to the director and I needed to be able to communicate to her. Um, and this was the first time we were working together. Fortunately, it wasn't the last. We continued to work together. Um, how I felt about the scene and what I wasn't feeling about the scene. And and you know, and and uh, it's always a, it's always a daunting thing. It can be, you know, because ultimately you are the first person to see. I mean, you know, you 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 are the first audience as an editor, and so you have to be able to not only you know evaluate your dailies on a technical level, but be able to obviously evaluate your dailies on an emotional level. And so. Um, ultimately, this was a scene where, after you know, discussing back and forth, and I had to quickly put put together a cut, and uh, which is also you know, sometimes somewhat daunting because people are waiting for you to do something, and because decisions have to be made. Um, so, ultimately, after putting together the first pass on this scene, um, it was decided that, in fact. She wanted to go back, she needed to go back and capture some more emotional elements from, uh, from this game. And so what you're gonna be seeing is a scene that was shot over two nights. Um, and ultimately, um, there's now, you know, layers ultimately were built onto this scene. So this is a scene from a film called Love and Basketball. And, uh, you know, let's take a look. I'll play you. What? One game, one on one. <laughs> For what? Your heart. <laughs> you out of your mind. So what, you gonna bitch up? Huh. What's that supposed to be, some psychology? Look, I know why you broke up with me in college. And not that it wasn't messed up. But I should have been there for you. I just didn't know how to do that and be all about ball. Monica, after that stuff with my dad, I couldn't trust anybody, OK? I was lost. That was five years ago. I've moved on. 
prove it. What will this prove? You once said the reason I beat you was because you wanted me to. So? So? If I win, it's because deep down you know you're about to make the biggest mistake of your life. And deep down, you want me to stop you. Yeah. And what happens when you lose? If I lose, I'll buy you a wedding present. First to ten. Five. You scared? I got better things to do. Check. One zip. Check. Why don't you D up this time? Two zip. Three zip. Where's the D? Sleepy? You need her? Come to play? So now you want to play. Are oh, you taking off your grace, huh? You think that's going to make you play better?
double or nothing. It's a fantastic clip. So can you just give us a quick um, idea of what she went back and shot the second night that changed that scene and made it, you know, what you were looking for? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, obviously this journey that these two people have taken, I mean, they, you know, grew up together. If you've ever seen, I mean, if, I hope those of you who haven't seen the film will see the film. You know, they meet um, as kids and they grow up and at a certain point they're each other's first love and then, you know, life splits them apart and then we get to this. And, you know, I f it was one of those scenes where I watched it and, um, I knew that we needed to understand that, that it wasn't about the game. You know, obviously it's not about the game. It's it's really about her fighting back and and you know, obviously throughout the game through the game, him remembering what they had. And so, um, initially, ultimately, the second night that um, we actually went back, we got a lot of the moments of the hands touching and you know the the body, a lot of the really tight body um, exchanges between them. Um, we had a lot of the looks, uh, you know, a lot of those moments I did kind of slow down a bit and give them the ability to kind of hang longer. Um, but a lot of it had to do with the looks between them, the slapping away, you know, just a lot of the kind of tight physical um, shots. Great, thank yeah. you. So we, I'm a terrible moderator because we only have about five minutes left, which is not a ton of time for Q&A, but if there's someone in the audience with a burning question, please um, wave your hand and, and we'll get to you. Yeah, right up front. I'm curious which you like better, editing for television or film, and why? Um, I prefer working for film because you, um, it'll, it'll, there's so much more to work with. Uh, I love working TV, and it's very, you know, hard, and the schedules are very hard, and film has a longer schedule and all. But when you're shooting television and you're shooting 16 scenes in a day or whatever it is, on film, they one of those scenes might take a day. So you're getting many more opportunities to use um, different angles and um, create... Um, for me, uh, more opportunity to, um, more options. There are more options in film because you have a lot more time. And uh, for me, that's this, you know, I love them both and I loved working on Alias and, um, you know, I did Felicity for a couple of years, but mainly, I. You know, the schedules were difficult, and then the days you had to wait for the producer, the, you know, the uh, writer producer to come in, and you'd be waiting there all hours, and kind of drove me crazy a little. So, <laughs> with film, you have a much longer time, and uh, as I say, it just, I feel there's just more, more film to, to use. All right, let's take one more question. In the audience? Me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this man shouting me. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thanks to you all for taking the time out of your day to talk to us. Uh, Tara Lynn, about the sequence that you just showed, I was curious, was that piece, the song that's behind it, written into the script? Was it something that you had when you were putting it together? Uh, can you talk about music in that sequence? Sure. Um, I, I love working with music all the time, and, and, and Gina, who's the director, is also someone who is very, very... Um, I usually ask my directors uh, before I sh you know we get into the cut and showing them the first cut, how they feel about it. Do they want to hear music? Do they not? Gina is someone who does. Um, so very, very early in our process, you know, even as she's shooting, she, as she writes, she has a playlist as she's shooting. Um, I start to listen to a lot of different things. This happened to be a situation where uh, Michelle Indigo Cello, whose music it is, had just come out with this album. And it was literally one of those things where I was driving into work one day, listening to music. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, we had tried things on this scene and it wasn't really, you know, hadn't found it. And so I brought the song in, uh, well, actually brought the whole album in to Gina and had her, you know, wanted her to listen to it. 
And then we tried it up against the uh, the film, and what was really amazing about it is, and it you know it happens, and it's like those happy accidents. We literally dropped it on, and it just <laughs> you know it's like we both looked at each other. It was like yeah, and so. And, I, and we didn't change, I mean, it literally, we didn't have to change anything. And um, it just, it kind of spoke to what she really wanted the scene to be about and the mood and the tone. And, and so, yeah, we, we, we found it. And of course, the, uh, you know, it's always hard because you don't know whether you'll be able to afford it. You don't know whether, you know, the you know, music supervisor just kind of rolls their eyes and like, okay, well, let's see what we can do. And fortunately, we were able to um, get the song. And then it turned out that, Gina's next movie, Michelle actually ended up doing the score on. So it worked out really well for everybody. That's great. I feel so privileged to sit here and talk with you. And thank you all so much for sharing your experience. Um, it's really inspiring to hear you talk about your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.